All right, so um, this is my second speech today. And um, my first one this morning, first this morning was on epic AI failures. This is the mirror image of that. These are epic success stories. But what, what I'm gonna do is talk about case studies in embedded AI that have actually gone into production. This is in theory. What I'm gonna talk about now is not what it should be. And, uh, but these are actual commercial success stories. So this is not academic only information. This, I will cover that. I will cover it here. <laughs> and where we're seeing penetration. And um, it's not a presentation on generative AI or massive, large, large database, large language systems. And um, so the emphasis is a practitioner. So I, I basically work in this space of sensor technology. I'm a adjunct professor here at the College of New Jersey. And uh, this is a space I've been in for quite some time, which is ultra low power sensors. And the goal here is how low can you go with sensor and be commercially viable and have it work? It's not a theory of the sense. It's where can I where can I hit the limits, the constraints and bounds of having sensors uh, applied ubiquitously? So what we want to do, my goal in life is to see embedded sensors structure in embedded structure and, and actually see it go in more of a ubiquitous situation rather than separate in installation. So I'm going to talk about applications where we can get to a, a power and get to focus is energy. And can we get low enough to be parasitically powered? Can we power, can we energy harvest enough energy to power sensors? So I'm gonna give you not a theory of whether you can get there or not, but how we do it. Okay, so, um, and again, I'm trying to distinguish between generative AI and machine learning. So machine learning, you'll find, and I'm gonna start to give a little bit of history of machine learning, and it's not obvious, and it's not well documented in the literature. So I'm gonna start off by talking about um, some of the first instances of embedded machine learning, successful. Uh, so when I, I always start out by looking at the architecture. So the architecture of a, of a typical remote sensor system, you have the sensor elements. You have application processor, very, again, machine level, machine language event classifier, and then a wireless element. And again, you get into trouble fast if you try to design this with off-the-shelf parts because what happens is the power, the power communication element exceeds by 10x, in some cases 20x, the power for the whole system from the sensor to the logic to the machine learning. So your dominant factor on, I would say 90% of sensor platform is the energy consumed by the transmit, when you transmit digital information. So the advances we've made in the last five years is the commercial viability of ultra low power, very long distance LP WAN, low power wide area network uh, components, silicon components. So that, that's a, what I would call a major breakthrough in sensor technology, sensor platform technology. <laughs> and, uh, so, like I said, the, the power supply is a little bit novel. Is that I look at the power supply as being photovoltaic motion and thermal. Now, of course, most the highest energy density is in today's technology is photovoltaic. But the sensors, the sensors that use photovoltaics in this kind of architecture with NBIOT or one of the lowest power communication elements are typically low enough where you're talking about sub two inch photo, photo uh, and it can be used internally, it can be used in, in, in uh, rooms, 
it can be used at a very low. But these are tiny. This photovoltaic can be one or two inches and in supply enough energy to continuously power the sensor platform and transmit information. And uh, we see that a couple examples I'm going to show you that uses that. And again, I, I highlighted in red where all the energy is going. So the energy that's coming is not necessarily in the sensors. There are some very high power sensors. Like I, I used a uh, part particulate sensor, 2.5 micron, that actually uses a motor and it actually uses laser, laser guidance to identify small particulates. For the New York um, Transit Authority, I was working on a consulting project where I was looking at a sensor that would be very low level uh, power and yet be portable enough and small enough that would would get away with maybe a small a small battery or a small rechargeable or a small primary or a large capacitor that would be another storage element that I could deal with bursts of sampling. Depending on my sample rate, I could turn on and off this electromechanical and optical sensor. On the other hand, you have sensors that are uh, advanced accelerometers that actually supply energy. So you have duality, you have the sensor itself supplying power. The other case I've seen uh, in the academic literature, but it has gone commercial, is to power building sensors that still look at structural structural uh, strength, structural health, they call it. That uses the actual concrete of the battery where that supplies energy for the sensor platform. And then build it right into sensing the uh, concrete condition. So there's some pretty novel ways that uh, can be applied to power here. And um, then we're moving to a third generation with the, the wireless transceivers primarily going uh, NBIOT, LTE, M, or LoRa. So these, these are very popular in uh, Europe right now, the LoRa. So we'll get a little bit into that. But let's talk about uh, some early examples of machine learning that you've never heard about. And you've never heard about it for good reason. So when your airbag goes off, how important is that, that it goes off, <laughs> right? Very important. Well, it, it, how important is it that it goes off at the wrong time with the wrong person sitting there? So when they first came out with airbags, you know, which quickly comes a volume of gases released in generator, nitrogen gas, it gets released and it builds up its airbag immediately to, to uh, very quickly. And so you have to uh, control an explosion and contain it. So what happens if I'm, I'm using the most popular sensor of a crash would be what? Accelerometer. So most people use accelerometers that sense conditions of whether the airbag gets deployed or not. But here's what happened in the early days. So in the late seventies, in the late seventies, they started deploying the airbags, but they don't work. Why don't they work? Because it didn't know the difference between, it did not sense the difference between a hole in the road or a uh, pothole <laughs> and, and a crash. So how do you know the difference between your, you hit a car versus you hit a pole pothole? Because I'm measuring Negative acceleration, right, on the accelerometer. Do you know how the acceleration is? Uh, typically, if you hit a pothole, you don't end up stopping. And if you hit a pothole hard enough or deep enough to make you stop, you probably need an airbag. So <laughs> if you stop, I assume that's a pretty good way to tell. Yeah. It, uh, or most of the stop. Well, what was happening is airbags were being deployed, and that doesn't, uh, it's not good. Because if you have somebody that's, let's say, 65 pounds, a child that's sitting, and the airbag goes off for the wrong reason, uh, you can kill a person, you can maim a person. So, so then early on, they said, well, we can be smart in that. Let's, let's use machine learning. Let's take the nascent neural network technology and we'll apply it to a learning a pattern. So you're learning a pattern of deceleration that's not a pothole. And then you're going to detect on 
physical accident versus other a non-critical physical accident, let's say a smaller accident. So you're going to need multiple accelerometers, but you're going to need smarts. You're going to need to know how am I going to differentiate between the pothole, the lightweight accident, and the one that could be potentially fatal. And it's a big deal, right? Whether I explode the bag or not. So anyhow, so this this year they came up with this idea of publicizing in the academic literature. How they're doing it now who's been doing this for years is and this was told to me by uh a, a, a accelerometer sensor manufacturer who said to me uh hey that's the family jewels so you take general motors you take toyota you take all the car manufacturers guess what what they trigger it with they have an ai team working on specifically neural net technology. They call it convolutional neural net, but that's what they were using. And, and it's, it's, a, it's a trade secret. We're not gonna publish it. We're not gonna put it in academic peer review literature because I'm with GM and this is our trade secret. When it deployed with bags is the difference between killing people and not killing people. So this is, this is an asset that GM has, or Ford has, that will be their business. So they kept this AI group secret. And they told, don't publicize anything. So in 1998, this is the first in, information that came from the peer-reviewed peer -reviewed academic literature where they're actually giving you an idea of what they're doing. But again, years before the groups were doing it and putting it into cars and production. So, um, by the way, the manufacturer in Massachusetts, uh, analog devices, PDI, ships over a million accelerometers a week and uh so that's what that's who's telling me this information which is kind of interesting and uh so i i would look at it as the first instance of any the ai so there's nothing external coming in other than the forces going to the accelerometers more than one accelerometer is used and then a uh a, a um, uh, uh, uh supervised this is by the way supervised learning so they would give it examples of a pothole. They give it examples of a lightweight accident where they don't want to uh, deploy the airbags. So what, what they're doing here, so they're giving examples of what to deploy and what not to deploy. So this is a, a network learns the difference. So how do you test this? Well, when you test it, you test it by isolating some of the cases that you didn't teach it. You know, supervised learning is all the examples of potholes and, and the airbag deployment, not airbag deployment. And then you give it a sample of the data for a test site. In this case, in Detroit, you know, they might be doing the test site. They thought that might be real world of type test sites that they do things like anti-lock breaks with their problems. They had to do real world test sites they built. Anyhow, so the learning system learns this, and then they keep testing and isolated cases, cases of uh, and see if it correctly identifies it. And then they'll go through a whole, whole the automotive industry goes through a whole type of uh, development process where they do, like I said, field testing and they do uh, initial batch runs. So they'll test this for a long period of time before they actually deploy it. So now we're into two. Uh, question isn't, isn't uh, are we still applying machine learning to uh, vehicle airbag deployment. It's a new car has 10 to what 12 airbags, maybe more. I don't know what they're up to now. I bought a new car and I guess I'm in the market and I finally get approachable in terms of not paying over MSRP. <laughs> but anyhow, so you can see that you have multiple multiple airbags tied to multiple control systems independently tied. So that's, uh, that's, again, my first example, which um, is very interesting. So here's, here's a program I worked on when I was at General Electric, and then my uh, chief programmer, he went over to, um, he went over to this company, and, uh, and they actually, Power Fleet, and they actually used the patents that uh, Dan and I worked on at GE on visual 
cargo sensors. So the ability to recognize uh, cargo sensor, uh, what was in the in the uh, in staff of the cargo, which I'll show you in a minute here. So if you look at the bottom part of this slide, this is smart machine learning attached cargo sensor that sits on the back by the door. And what it does is can, can actually look at the cargo ship. Here's an example of cargo ship. This is what it should look like when you open a, a freight door, a cargo door. And this, you might see this because of the, you know, forces inside that's been moving pallets and moving. But most importantly, what, what what's meaningful? What, what makes money for this company? Well, when they come back and it's empty, how do they know it's empty? We got a smart camera that's not sending a picture of the image of the of the of the trailer saying it's empty. So think about the ramifications of sending a semaphore. There's no cargo in the back. There's no uh, nothing at all, and um, so the percent loading is zero versus so many skids or no skids. So it knows the difference between skids and no no uh, no pallets pallets. And it knows the order of what it should be. And if it sees something that approaches empty, they can immediately say, hey, look, this, this Walmart fleet is in Atlanta and it's going to go back empty. So, what's the worst fear in a logistics trucking company? Shipping air. Shipping air, exactly. They call it deadheading. Exactly. Yeah. You must know something about that. That's exactly right. So, now I can tell with the smart camera. And I don't send a lot of information. I just say, hey, it's empty. So now Walmart or whoever owns this asset can now flag on a, a site, an auction site, make an auction space available for coming back from Atlanta, which is empty. Or it's half full. Like there's a half load and available to move it back at a reduced price. So they auction off space in the logistics. So this camera has got a smart neural net in it. And it identifies the presence of people. So we can tell if the cargo door has been open. What person has gone and has started pulling the load out? Yeah. Uh, is the processing for that done on the camera or is it done somewhere else? Right, right. So, so here's the vision. And like I said, I personally know the programmer of this who did the AI stack and got the libraries all linked on this thing. And this is in full production, by the way. So, so what they're what they're doing is trying to get all the way to the edge. Meaning, inside that box, they want a a trained, supervised, trained decision making stack that makes the decision to send back percentful, empty, disarray. It's a special kind of uh, pallet you're going to need equipment for. You can identify the like I said, people involved. Is this the same? On loader because you have the last time at this Walmart store. Oh. So you got all that great, great information. So their first attempt was to put it all on the chip. And that worked, kind of. But now start doing facial recognition. They weren't at a point where it worked successfully. They were looking for the upper 98% success recognition of someone's face. So what they have is now they have a frame, not video, but they'll take a frame or two and send it back to a large Azure server, and then they'll so they'll actually recognize it offload. Facial recognition may need a little bit more power at the at the uh, edge. We call this at the edge. So the goal is always to put it on on the chip, right? Yeah. Uh, so where is that camera located? Do you have more than one? And what happens if it's blocked? Yeah. In this case, the power fleet. Is one and it's above. It's by the door and above, so they can do it. Oh, okay, so it's, it doesn't get blocked easily. It doesn't get blocked easily. Yeah. yeah. By the way, you can see as it's getting blocked too, right? So you you know you know when it stops immediately because in addition to this camera, on the on the telematics part, this is the other sensor platform because you get sensors to detect location. You got GPS. You have accelerometers and motion sensors to see if the if the vehicle's moving. How long it's been moving? Is it being pulled out of the yard? Is it being lifted out of the yard? Or has it been on the highway? And how many hours has it been moving? 
they know all that information and they can tell a uh, pattern type of day they can do they can do um, fencing geofencing around yards so they know if they're getting more close to the distribution center versus the stores they can tell what store it's within a mile of because they have localized geofencing sensors so this thing is loaded with sensors this is just one one more smart sensor that they have on this power device and um, so what we see in logistics is just more and more intelligence. And like I said, I, I, I think there's going to be a point in time recently, soon, I should say, that they're going to be able to do the facial recognition without any communication back to the server. You know, the machine trained server. And, but they're playing the... Now, if all they wanted to do is look at cargo space, they can do that today. They can cut the whole pies. But the other thing that's real interesting is they're not sending video, they're sending a frame. Now, slow scan TV is very energy efficient. And we'll see another application, we'll do another application where they're doing slow scan TV. So, uh, yeah. I was just going to say, it, it probably relates to what you're going to say in a minute, but having all this processing and stuff happen on device limits the amount of stuff you need to send back to bytes unless you're doing a, a picture. Exactly. Yeah, it's exactly. only a few bytes. Yeah. And so, exactly. Here, here's my point. So what's my goal in designing sensor systems? Power reduction, energy, drop, 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 drop. So if I can solve my problems without even transmitting information, better yet, I send a sem semaphore saying it's empty. How many bytes does it take for me to send an empty flag? Technically one, but you should have one bit. But you you have you need, right, yeah, you, you'll need a byte, let's say, a byte. So having worked with designing these sensors that you are, we ended up designing our own over, over the year protocol. So if you look at, at Shannon's law, the way to get messages through very narrow bandwidths is become very, very reliable because what you can do is then uh, with Shannon's law, the higher the data rate, the less distance you get. So now some of these things are going into Central America, and I have to be able to track them all the way into other countries. So then you start looking at protocols that work. We design our own satellite protocols where we said, hey, 13, by 13 bytes, 13 bytes of information is all I need to send location, motion sensor, uh, geofencing information, cargo door sensors, just, you know, on off kind of cargo door. So I, I can do that in 13 bytes. And I can slip it through the LEO satellite, keep the traffic ultra low. Shannon's law says, well, not only that, but I have better signal to noise ratio because I'm going narrow band and I'm going very slow bit rate. So we were getting it, we were getting results in the LEO satellite where and then we're paying for bytes, right? And we're, we're having a, a whole fleet in less than a megabyte, a whole fleet. <laughs> so we were, we were squeezing out monthly bills of, uh, I don't know, $2 or two per, per asset per 53 foot trailer. We were getting it down below $2 per satellite. So I could track this into Mexico, Guadalajara, uh, Guadalajara, anywhere in down South Mexico, Central America. Honduras, and uh, we had to do that for Walmart's fleet. So we ended up using satellite and we use a very low bit rate. So what's key about the low bit rate is now I can use intelligence to classify this. Again, the simple thing is uh, I'm 50% loaded, I'm 0% loaded, I'm, uh, and that can go as, as low as one byte. And theoretically, 13 bytes if I want to stand, location stand, latitude and longitude. I can do that stand too, anywhere in the world for 13 bytes. Hey, that's pretty cool stuff. And it's, uh, it gives you some idea. But the progression is to do more, more classification. It, facial recognition is not that easy yet. So that, that's why they're doing that one part offline. And they'll sell it without facial recognition and it's a cheaper box where they'll do the classification for facial. Yeah, this is pretty interesting stuff, right? Um, here's another thing that uh, I, I wasn't aware of it until I read this uh, 
academic article, peer reviewed article. I think it was in, uh, yeah, an IEEE sensor stuff. But here's what's interesting I learned a lot about orchard, apple orchards. What's the problem in an apple orchard? Let's suppose I have, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of acres of apple orchard. And uh, I can't send people out looking for the deadly parasite called the coddling moth. What I can do is build a smart camera with a little bit of bait for the coddling moth. In every station, in every orchard, so many trees in an orchard, right? So a small geographic area, I could put some coddling moth bait, which is destructive to an entire apple orchard. Once the uh, coddling moth gets penetrated, it destroys an apple orchard. So this is kind of cool, cool article. So, we, so, so the engineers and the researchers behind this said, hey, we're going to design this thing because it has to be energy independent. You got to be out for zero energy because it's got to be out in an orchard. We can't supply batteries. It can't recharge the batteries. Um, I can use, uh, in this case, let's see what they used on this thing. They used a photo, uh, a photovoltaic TV, a very clean TV. Um, so here's the mission. It's very novel how they're doing this. Let me just show you how it's getting into this discussion about bandwidth. And what you really need to send send data for. So what do you want to do when you? Okay, so you're looking for this coddling moth. Got a camera. You're going to do edge detection. You're going to going to say, okay, I'm trained this on fifteen, maybe hundred fifty coddling moth examples. That's within the view of this sensor and the bait. And um, I'm going to test it by taking data it hasn't seen and see if it can find the moth in the data. And what else am I going to do? So I'm putting this in the orchard, and I'm getting a signal back, and it might be 15 miles on a mountaintop. I can't get to it too quickly, but then one of the sensors goes off and says, I found a coddling moth in site 03, grid 03 of the apple orchard. What you can do is tell it then, send it a command and say, let me take a picture of what you see. So they send a picture, not a video, they send one frame. And it might take, uh, heck, it might take five minutes at that bandwidth, very narrow bandwidth. I'm taking a slow scan TV image of this coddling law in high resolution. It could be 4K, and it might take me 10 minutes to send the image. But I can get a razor sharp, high resolution picture once I determine there's a high probability of a coddling moth in the trap area. So now it goes, it goes into slow scan 2D mode and pulls the image back and processes that directly. And then lets somebody look at it and see yeah. if that's correct. And it gets added to the supervised learning uh, layer. So it gets to one of that. Anyhow, this is in production too. This was prototyped and in production in Italy. And um, I thought that was pretty novel how they're doing. So they're doing, they can say this is an ultra low power because it's not always on, it's mostly off. And it's mostly not transmitting anything. Okay, this talks about its uh, accuracy tests of a 40 by 40 image. They're getting above 80%. Convolutional neural net, they call us a nice name, Smart Agricultural Neural Network, SAN. Reduced in size, it's probably going to see where it gets into the energy uh, part. Uh, so, interestingly enough, these researchers are the future of engineering because these people are designing the sensor platforms in terms of how much energy in terms of millijoules. Mm -hmm is the overall energy consumption. So they're designing an entire sensor platform based on how many molecules it's using, which is really cool. And let's see if they have, and they, they do have a very small PV on this one. All right, let me jump gears and uh, talk a little bit another case study here that uh, they, we call structural health management monitoring. What we end up doing here is uh, you want to monitor civil infrastructures. 
State of New Jersey has got a lot of problems with their bridges. If you look at the day it was built or the year it was built, you might just say, I want to replace all the bridges in New Jersey or half the bridges in New Jersey because they were built before, before 19, uh, 1900, you know? And there's a lot of bridges built before 1900, but you can't do that. It's too expensive, you know? It costs a fortune. And yet you cannot, uh, you, not, you can't afford to take the risk. So what do they do today? They have a lot of civil engineering professors at Rutgers that go around measuring cracks in bridges in New Jersey. So they have certain areas they cover of bridges over a certain date that look like they are uh, beyond their prime time. And they look for small cracks and they monitor and log cracks. So they're human beings that go out and watch that. That's obviously not ideal. So what we say now is, hey, I've got an ultra low power sensor platform. I'm gonna bury it right into the bridge. I'm gonna put it into the bridge so I can constantly look at the, the forces applied to the bridge. It makes a great earthquake detector too, at the same time. So you can see the, um, the architecture of this is, in this particular design was to use a um, low cost men's accelerometer, very low cost. And then you could look at minor, minor motions you can set up in a differential measurement and look at very tiny motions and then decide whether it means is there a crack forming or is there structural damages in the structure itself? What can I detect structural damage? So there's a lot of research being done in this area right now to take and look at look at uh, the feature space coming off of an accelerometer. And I'll show you what that looks like. Okay, and like I said, so they're also measuring by energy, power consumption. They wanna put this embedded right onto the bridge, right, put it right onto the concrete parts of the bridge where the structural struts. And um, so what are you gonna look for? You're gonna look for an accident? You're gonna look for, uh, well, you're gonna look at, you're gonna do what's called a fast Fourier transform. So you're gonna look at what kind of Energy is coming right from the bridge itself or the structure. So we call these the modal, the modal frequency of buildings and structures. So they're looking at a particular, notice this frequency, uh, three hertz. They're seeing an energy stimulation on the structure. And there is another resonant frequency. This looks like the primary modal frequency of uh, eight point. Uh, Three eight hertz. So two things are listed: the power spectrum. FFT gives you power frequency and amplitude spectrum, energy spectrum, and it's making a decision that hey, this bridge has changed. I've seen the eight the eight hertz primary modal frequency moving. That means you got a problem. The bridge is deteriorating fast, so you better go figure out what the deviation is and how that correlates. To a bridge failure. See, in terms of damage, you're seeing a shift in frequency. When you start damaging the structure, you see, yeah. How does, uh, I guess, traffic, temperature, and other environmental conditions affect that? Like if it's a super rainy right. day in winter versus a still day in summer? No, that's a good question. Because they, those variables are all influential, what they see. So, Again, this thing goes into machine learning and it says this is typical of a winter day. This is typical of this change, the new seismic thing that we're seeing in other places. Um, but ultimately, you've got to correlate those peaks back to what's going on, what's being damaged in your structure. So it becomes a, a smart system. You got to put some intelligence in. So why not? Why not train a uh, uh, neural network? That. So this is what we're doing. Why is this important? Okay, everybody knows about I-35. So I, uh, right outside of Minnesota, I-35 bridge collapsed. Who okay. asked people? Um, the Federal Bureau of Transportation has a list of seventy thousand U.S. bridges is deficient, structurally deficient. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't want to be on that bridge, <laughs> you know. Um, 
more than 77,000 are, co are categorized as obsolete. This is not a warm and fuzzy, you know, this is like, we've got to do something about this. And again, New Jersey does not have enough money to replace the bridge. Probably not two of the bridges, let alone all of them. Anyhow, so, so you got a uh, structurally deficient bridge that must be visually inspected every year. So that's a lot of civil engineering people out measuring, you know. So, um, so when the I-35 collapsed, so geez, we should have put sensors on this uh, bridge so we wouldn't know it was ready to collapse. <laughs> so what they did is they built a, um, a bridge. They replaced that bridge, the I-35 bridge, with a new bridge. And here's what they're doing now. So they're, they're taking the structure. Their, member, their, their sensors are being activated with any kind of asset, crane, or car that's going over the bridge. So you get a particular pattern. This is in time domain. So you get a damp, damp wave oscillation of the bridge buildings, in this case, the bridges. So guess what? If something, what you want to see is not the time in the time domain, you want to go back to the, the frequency domain and look at the power spectrum and how much it's deviating. That's your net. You can trigger a net here. So, um, so you have a neural network that's training, that's being trained, and that looks for patterns that go from here. And then feature extraction is usually going from time to frequency, as I said, wherever you can get the feature extraction of damage you know, related to it, uh, the uh, signal. And then the ANN is what you train it on, and then you trigger it based on a certain pattern. Well, geez, I've seen this change dramatically. So this bridge is under in in uh, in trouble. Or we should find out where where the crack is or where the damage is on this bridge. And then it can be like uh, barges that hit in Louisiana that hit that one. You can immediately test it, see it in real time, because it changes dramatically when you start seeing an entire support structure that fails. And that's the predicate for. In this case, an entire train going into the water. Yeah. Uh, there's another question before we move too much further. Um, those sensors built into the bridge, are they right. external, like replaceable, or are they encased in the bridge? Well, for this bridge over the replace, this is I 35's replacement bridge. I think it's St. John's. It runs parallel to it. So this is external. But what you want to do is you're on to something because oh, I want to see it in, internal. So I actually have that's the right way to do it. Well, I have a, a rebuttal to that. Uh, yeah. If so, the previous slide showed that they were using 4G communication, right? Um, but when they shut 4G down, which they definitely will, will bridges just stop having this feature, or will that people reading my writings? Yeah, I mean, that's, no, yeah. It's, 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 that is my so you bring up a really good point. So Whenever you commit to a communication media, uh, if you're using cell, cell cellular type transmissions, LTE or even 5G, what happens when the, the, the telecom, the carrier, pulls the plug and says, we're going to go, you know, this is so obsolete, we're going to go 6G. Well, we're actually going to pull 5G cards out of our cage and we're moving on. So it could be four years from now, it could be two years from now. Could be six years from now. I don't know. They probably, They've so. done this. Yeah. I've gotten burned by this. Where that were I worked on a project. This is a true story. I mean, this is exactly what we see with cellular. Mm -hmm. So I spent maybe two million dollars of my boss's money mm -hmm. on a cellular device that was a smart cellular device that could track pets and track uh, children and track track people. Uh, and and what you want to do is use a cellular network. You're not going to put a big satellite system up together on that. You don't have the size of the antenna or the visibility all the time. And uh, so we use 2.5G. We started with 2.5G. By the time the project got launched, we got the announcement saying, um, yeah, it was AT&T saying, we're going to grandfather you, but we're going to phase this out eventually. So within a year, they, they pulled the plug on it. So I went back to my boss and I said, we have to recertify it for a 
4G modem. At that time, there was 3G, but I would say I bought a leapfrog to protect my assets. You know, at this point, my boss is going to lose a lot of money. He says, no, I'm not going to put any more money in because the phone, phone company moved on. You know? So that's a real problem today. And they were originally talking about putting all this advanced sensors in automobiles. But it was in the automobiles with the original, what was the original? I was about to bring up the Tesla example with the 3G cards. Yeah. All these 2012 or 13 Teslas, right. I think it was 2012 or 13, yeah. that have 3G communication only. And right. it's like a several thousand dollar replacement to get that upgraded right. if you can. Yeah. Uh, so they've done this, tw this at least twice in my memory. So they did it on the first OnStar. OnStar was, believe it or not, launched under AMPS. You know how long ago AMPS was on there? There's no such thing as AMPS. It doesn't exist. So they had to pull out every vehicle that had, assuming you want an emergency service, you, AMPS don't work anymore. So your, your OnStar, your old Cadillac, doesn't work anymore. So that's it. They call that planned obsolescence. I have not a, a good thing. I have another example. I had a cell phone I got. Uh, it was yes. from Huawei, but it was one of the U.S. branded phones. This one right. was one of the first ones they did. I actually loved it. It was amazing. But they tried to save money in the modem, and they included a 3G modem for voice and 4G modem for data. Most yeah. of the time, it's just one modem that does both. Right. Right. They split it out for, for cost reasons or maybe compliance reasons or compatibility or something. Yeah. So I got US data here, but voice was all 3G. I had to get new phone when they turned 3G off. Right. I love that. It, it was like still relevant at the time. It was like three and a half years old, but high spec at the time. I And they just shut me off. And I don't really want to bridge yeah. and shut off. And that might happen. <laughs> no, you bring up the, probably the biggest thing that keeps me awake at night. Is I design a sensor platform and it's obsolete in a year, two years. You can't do that. So a lot of people, like for for emergency communication, what they've done is they've taken two LP low power wide area network systems and run them simultaneously. So they have they call it a multi RAT system, radio. So RAT R and RAT stands for radio access technology. So at emergency drones, for example. What, what do you want to do in a, a UAV or a HAP system when it's an emergency situation and you know, your grid is down? How do you want to communicate? Well, here's the, there's good, the good news is that the cellular equivalent to um, NBIOT and can handle 50,000 simultaneous data channels. So if you're texting, and it, like Hurricane Maria hit uh, Puerto Rico, they were down, um, the cities, they were down almost uh, two to three weeks. In the countryside, they went down for, the grid went down for almost six months to a year. Cellular, forget it. Forget it, cellular didn't work. So there's very few things that work when the grid goes down. So in this case, um, you, you know, you have to plan ahead a little bit, and some of these protocols will work well if you support the network. So if you design the network, the technical literature labels this as ad hoc. So Harris Corporation does ad hoc networks in emergencies and wars. So they'll fly out to uh, Ukraine, for example. If there's a problem in Ukraine, and the grid is down, and the Russians have bombed the grid, and they bombed the cellular towers. What do you do? Well, you call Harris, and Harris drops it, drops communications, ad hoc, complete network systems that work mm -hmm. autonomously, or they fly a UAV, or half, half is a balloon. When you see a balloon, and you know it's from China, and it's, <laughs> it's got a payload the size of a car, it's tracking all, all, all telephone communication for that whole area of Montana, half the state of Montana, it's tracking. Well, the center point is the or is our launch system. All 15 people. So when they came in, they, they were, I know what they were doing. They were, no, you, what you do is you do a circle, geofence, and every all the phones you have, the probability that you have nuclear attacks are pretty good. No, I've, I've been through that area. I was like all 15 people. Yeah, yeah. Really well, they, they all work for the bomb for the yeah. uh, back, what do they call it, the launch site. So, what do you think the Chinese government, not the people, government's problem? But anyhow, I knew what they were doing at the balloon. That was COVID. It's a high altitude 
um, base station they were running and they were capturing all those phone calls. And they do that whenever there's a riot, whenever they think there's a conflict, whenever they think that there's a January 6th, they're arresting people January 6th, they're picking, they picked up their phone call with the a predator, electromagnetic predator, which is capturing all phone calls within the whole capital area. And then they go in and identify, do the lookup table. They, they tell Verizon and AT&T to give up the, the, the customer contacts, which they do in, in homicide investigations now, but they get the whole, here's the whole database. We want to list to everybody that was there at the Capitol on January 6th. Anyhow, that's getting off. <laughs> that's a little bit of a problem, but, but yeah, you got to be careful. And sometimes you want to sign your network. But Laura, Laura is a, a good example of a low power wide area network. You're in control of the gateway. You're in control of the infrastructure, the whole star network. You own it. Oh, so in agriculture, I see Laura going all fall off because mm -hmm. you're you're you know you're not controlled by the cell phone. I was about to say, are there systems that have their own locally administered network and then they hook into right. the internet via exactly. 4G base stations or else? Yeah, so that's Laura. Laura oh. does that, and they don't have to hook into any any base station. So there's a cell sufficient ad hoc network and. And they're used in like apple orchards, like we saw that. That's perfect for a Laura, Laura land type network because then they're in total control. <laughs> Providers can come and go. Uh, when I was with GEE, we used our own satellite network, so we were in control of the satellite network. Um, okay, so here's where they mounted the sensors. They call them St. Anthony Falls Bridge was the backup bridge. But that's really good point, yeah. And it shows you all of that. They overkilled it. Obviously, they built all kinds of stuff. The sensors they used were all expensive and high power. They are air AC powered systems. <laughs> so they're, they're consuming over 200 watts. Not my ideal design, but they were in a hurry to get some system they could monitor, a bridge up that they could monitor. Okay. Okay, so when we look at energy margin, and since most of the energy is done in the transmission, an engineering uh, situation would be you would look at your entire transmitter weight gain, uh, propagation path loss, that describes the propagation in the equations, and, on, and so forth. So the, the whole system is what we look at for design for um, long range systems, like a LoRa network and, and NDI too, if you do all this. They call this link, link margin calculations. You know, look this up here. So it just shows you some of the equations we're using. So this is this is brand new. Okay, so this technology is really, really new. And it's uh, this kind of sensitivity shows that you can get, especially with the UAV up in the air, on minus 137 feet seems sensitive. We're talking 50,000 kilometers or better better than 50,000 kilometers, perfect for emergency situation or large agricultural orchards. And here's the various, though, I mentioned Laura, Laura Wayne, Sigfox is another one. Actually, Sigfox was the first low power long distance. And then they have TI sub, sub gigahertz narrow band. Again, the trade off is I'm not going to do a lot of video with this. This is all very slow, but very far. Very, very great ranges. Um, let's see here. And this is uh, Shannon Wong. Our power playing games with getting, getting, getting ever. And I've seen systems and I've tested systems that can do 100,000 kilometers with 200 milliwatts. We have a Princeton professor that spends his whole life trying to see what he can do by designing protocols and sending signals that will be a few more lines and go as great as possible distance. Probably has spent the last 30 years of his life doing that kind of stuff. And you know, people, fans of his, uh, include some of the professors here, like uh, Dr. Katz, he's a big fan of um, Joseph Taylor, Dr. Taylor. So this guy does for fun to see how far he can get with what power at what frequencies and what bandwidth. So he designs his own protocols and he gets a experimental licensing through amateur radio and he gets all the different frequencies and he can, and then he can decide what propagation conditions he wants to follow and match with 
with his protocol. So anyhow, it becomes a game to see how far you can get. You know, the goal is to get thousands of miles in one milliwatt. And that's some, some of the games he plays. He, he's this, the co-discoverer of pulsars, and he has a Nobel Prize winning. Win. It's pretty cool to work with a guy like that. Um, and this is some of the work we do with the power analysis and the cellular modules. And again, to get, the game is to get as low as possible so I can start using vibration in the tiny solar cells or vibrations in the building itself to power the building sensors. Uh, is there any questions at all? Uh, thanks for all your questions. You're, you're actually on, on top of this thing. Uh, I think a few slides ago you were going over um, delta and energy for, uh, sent out from the transmitter versus energy. Yeah, received. they call that link margin. And that, just to clarify, that is the uh, energy that it is able to gain minus the energy lost through trying to transmit to the sky. Exactly. Uh, that is yeah. the energy that has to work with the power its own cell plant that was sent back. Yeah. Yeah, so what you see here, for the, if this is on the transmitter side, you got a plus 20 ppm. It's always in ratio. It's in decibels per milliwatt. And so it's it's transmitting with plus 20 ppm. And the cable itself drops 1 dB. So it drops the power. You're losing 1 dB of energy of power, specifically, when you go across the cable. And now when you get it to an antenna, you get it, an antenna monopole is good for 2 dB. I, I mean, like, so you get gains with an antenna. Excuse me, not, not a lot being a single, single element. But that's how you read this. And FSPL is your free space propagation loss. So watch this. So this goes minus 147.41 dBm. So the distance between the device and the antenna, that little cable is. One. One. And then 600 kilometers is 147. Right. That is a very resistive cable by comparison to air, I assume. Well, it might be in the jungle. I don't know where it is. It might be in an area that's uh, in, indoors. Well, what I mean is that air, 600 kilometers, seems like a lot for negative 147 compared to one, which is right. a couple centimeters. How long is this? Right. This is a really long. Well, I mentioned the sport that Dr. Katz does. Mm -hmm. And he, this, this propagation loss. That he works with is in the minus 250 dBm. Now that's to the moon and back. <laughs> so it's a sport to see how, how to communicate between the Earth in um, Hamilton Square, Hamilton, to some town in Tokyo, by Tokyo, Japan, via the moon is the propagation. Again, this is a sport. Right. This is can I do this or not? Can this work? This work. So at three in the morning, if you want to go with Doctor Katz, is this is what he's doing? He's trying to see how low he can go. And so now you got another antenna on the receiver, and then you gain two dBi, and then you've got the gateway or uh, gateway, and here's your margin, and this is what you receive. So I can receive down to minus one thirty seven dBm. So you just do the math. It's additive. DBM is additive, which is nice. You don't have to use. Yeah. Yeah. So you talked about the uh, uh, wireless technology is becoming obsolete in a matter of years, but also the uh, digital technology. It's planned. They, they plan oh, it. Oh, oh, well, yeah. my question is about yeah. how do you deal with the digital technology becoming obsolete? For example, in your slide, you use TI uh, ASIC. Now, how long is that ASIC going to be in production? And and how you going if you embed it? In the middle of the structure, how do you how do you, how do you even take it out? Let's let's replace it. Let's let's replace it with something new. Right. Well, that's how a good you point because question? yeah. Well, I I tell you who's faced with that. The military is faced with that. Sure. All the military branches have designed in electronics that most of it's obsolete. The chips, the ICs, the VLSIs, they're obsolete. So now you have a nascent business, including a company over here, that's building obsolete chips. The reverse engineering the chips. And they're in business to make obsolete parts for the military. And they get it pretty far for it. I mean, these are, they pay. What does the military do? You know? I mean, the state of New Jersey is used military technology for 7,000 years. 
Right. You know, you Absolutely. You got to understand the network. I would only recommend an ad hoc network that you're it's under your control. Uh huh. Does well, you cellular? Say, I don't you know. Build the processors. What's that? At the bridge, you're, you're going to have sensors to some processor. It's going to integrate the signal and send it off to some some. So you're looking at a replacement cost of the chips itself. Yeah, I think general it's a maintenance issue because they're not going to last. How long do they last in a in an outdoor environment or even buried in concrete? Uh, 30, 40 years. Oh, that's not so bad. Yeah, as long as they keep going. Yeah, yeah, the process will be, be dead by then, so. <laughs> it's not as bad as Apple. When I take my Apple iPad 1, they laugh at me. Hey, you got to be kidding me. Yeah, yeah. Throw it away, give it to your kids, and buy a new one, you cheapskate. They, they tell me that. I don't know I don't want any Apple stuff. But that's another story. Yeah. I was just saying the, the chips that were made in the 80s, where we only we only had like 20 years of experience making them, are still lasting a lot of environments, especially in case they're really well connected. And also, I mean, how many centers could there be for a bridge? And how much do yeah. people cost? How much would it cost to buy 40 years of replacement, assuming you know, even if they all die? Well, the, new, the new chips will it cost. Well, then believe it or not, it's, 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 a known, it's a known fact with inside inside Intel that the chips will wear out. Oh, that's well, that's a new problem from how, how we may have a shelf life. life. Well, I would now, they, they, yeah. they, 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 not, not a shelf life, but as they're used, okay. they will eventually wear out. Yeah, but I got to tell you, I would worry more. I would we worry about more uh, when the uh, people's liberation money goes into Taiwan. Taiwan has got 80% of the chip mm -hmm. energy. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, it's, it's in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. Really? I want to take care of themselves. I know we can take care of them. With their, their rumor is the fallback is the DMSC plant. I, I know. I think it's that, that, that China will not be able to use Taiwan. They, Taiwan. they use the parts, right? Yeah. Taiwan is ready. Yeah. I, I think no matter what happens, it's going to be on the news. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure we'll, we'll. Well, anybody that's an Apple, you're not going to get the Apple parts anymore. That's no, they're moving. Yeah, oh, they're going to Malaysia, aren't they? Or no, they're going to India. In India, okay. Well, I know they're putting production in India. Yes. Yeah. Chips and stuff. Yeah. It's a real problem. And my consulting company, we got a contract on trying to understand the NBIOT chips. Where's the licenses from? The Qualcomm licenses. Well, that makes an easy answer, right? No, because Qualcomm has those chips made by license in Taiwan, a technical material okay. corporation. <laughs> So, uh, well, Intel's trying to uh, upseat uh, TSMC now. Yeah. Because I don't know if you saw the news this week. Intel created their own, split their company into Intel and Intel Foundry. Yeah. So, I think the founder of TMSC in Taiwan what, worked for either, well, he worked for both it's Intel and very It's very incestuous. I, I mean, the people that. who started Intel came yeah. from Fairchild and, you know. Yeah. Um, but the thing is that uh, the genius is, is went from the U.S. to Taiwan and built up Taiwan. The guy is a genius. I think he worked at Texas Instruments. T.I. He yeah. started T.I. Yeah. yeah. But Pat, Pat Gelsinger said he wants Apple's business back. Okay, I'm wrapping this up. Any questions, guys? Any questions? Thoughts? I'll be around, I guess, for a little bit.